Awesome. Hello again, my name is Brock Young. It is my pleasure to be here. A little more background on myself. I'm a retired active duty Army officer and 100% disabled veteran who participated in a federal skill bridge internship with the very agency I became the deputy director of. Due to a reorganization and changing of my job title, I am now a program specialist with the Oregon Federal Executive Board and am responsible for the veteran and military spouse outreach training like this and events throughout our Western region. Western region of the Federal Executive Board consists of Alaska, Washington State, Idaho, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii, and the, and the Pacific Territories. There are an additional 28 federal executive boards across the country, all broken into four regions, Western, Central, Southern, and Eastern. The FEBs work to link senior agency officials and build cooperative interagency relationships between federal, state, and local governments, as well as the private stakeholders. One of the things we assist agencies and agency leaders to do is to find methods and ways to fix resource shortfalls, talent being one of them. I use my position to help federal partners fill priority vacancies and help folks like yourself, veterans, transitioning service members, members of the public, military spouses, et cetera, become more competitive when applying for those positions. In addition to offering this webinar, we do facilitate the Veterans Federal Employment Collaborative, or VFEC, a national collaborative that focuses on connecting federal agencies and vacancies with qualified veterans and transitioning service members, as well as military spouses. The LinkedIn group will be shared at the end of this presentation for anyone who is interested in learning more. I do want to stress that this presentation isn't just for veterans, transitioning service members, or military spouses. However, there will be a lot of information put out that is specific to them, as well as to highlight uh, a an upcoming event that happens on January 31st, specifically for military spouses. Up front, one of the biggest things preventing talented people from becoming federal employees is their resume. That's where why we are all here after all, the federal resume. Think of the federal resume as an assessment of your writing abilities, research skills, and how well you follow instructions. But perhaps federal resume development isn't really what we're the right name for what we're trying to do here. Why? Because regular federal resumes won't get you interviews or a federal job. You're going to need more. You're going to need to put your resume on beast mode in order to set you apart from the hundreds, sometimes thousands of applicants who are also competing for the same position. What about remote jobs, you might ask yourself? If you're looking for that remote job unicorn, then you'll not only be competing against an even greater number of applicants, but you'll also be competing against time. Most remote announcements often close the same day that they are posted because the agency has reached their application quota and doesn't have the HR resources in order to review and rate thousands and thousands of applications. Excuse me, applications. This is why it's important uh, to point out everyone seeking a federal career, excuse me, which is an important point to everyone seeking a federal career, remote or not. An increasing number of non-remote announcements are also beginning to limit their application quotas. We will discuss best practices and what you can do to help overcome these challenges in this presentation as well. And yes, for those of you that uh, are probably 80s kids or 90s kids and played uh, played in things called arcades, I know that no one knows what that is anymore, but uh, I am dating myself with this animation. Finding and securing a federal career is a process. Some have called it a job in and of itself. We're here to help prepare you and your resume so that when opportunities pop up, you will be ready to jump on them. Besides the federal resume, how else can you help prepare? Well, ask yourself, how are you getting hold of announcements that you are interested in and or qualified for? Do you have a USA Jobs search saved? Do you have it sent to you daily or weekly? Are you looking for that remote unicorn? And if so, are you applying for those jobs in the morning or evening? All of these things need to be considered and could mean the difference between being able to apply for your dream job or losing your chance. Um, real quick, can I just get a thumbs up for some people if you are uh, you're hearing me okay? Cool, I got a couple, all right.
diving right in. Um, we'll talk about what we're, we will cover by first touching on what we won't be covering. Next, we will discuss the federal resume, dispel some myths, and cover a broad overview of the resume development process. We will then dive into building your federal resume. This will include sources you can and should get information from, different formats, required and optional sections, etc. Next, we'll discuss what specialized experience, competencies, and the assessment questionnaire are and how to tailor your resume to them. We will then talk about methods of wordsmithing and adding context to your experience. We'll then go into translating your experience, which is really important for our veterans and those looking to change jobs, agencies, or career fields. Finally, we'll go over some closing tips and additional resources. Again, please hold all of your questions until given the opportunity to ask them. I don't want to miss something that you put into the comments section earlier in this presentation. I am a one man show or one person show on this event, so I am trying to um, give the presentation as well as monitor the chat. So um, I will stop every so often for questions, um, and then we will have a longer Q&A at the end of the presentation. Again, please keep your microphones on mute unless called upon or are reading. Um, then we will pause about the one hour mark um, for a short five minute break and then dive into the final half of our presentation. I don't wanna waste your time on things that you may already know, or there are th uh, things and, and resources that already have um, excellent means to answer. USA Jobs and the Office of Personnel Management have a great series of videos explaining how to use the system, apply to jobs on USA Jobs, as well as to answer other questions you might have about the federal hiring process. These are some useful links, and the link to the USA Jobs YouTube channel will be provided at the end of this presentation. There are tons of myths out there uh, that often prevent or discourage people from applying to federal job. I want to dispel some of them about the federal resume and about the federal hiring process. The first myth is first because it's a big one I run into frequently. Um, the myth is that those retiring from active duty or the active duty military have to wait 180 days to get a federal job. The fact is upfront for those who may be retiring from active duty, the 180 day employment restriction only applies to military retirees and only for certain DOD jobs and organizations. But even then, there is a waiver process, as well as careers, job series, locations, et cetera, that aren't included in this restriction. So before you turn your back on DOD agencies, make sure you know the facts and whether or not they are one of the ones included in the restriction or not. This is a next, uh, the next big myth is a huge one for everybody. The myth is that a federal resume should not exceed two pages. The fact is a federal resume requires more information than a civilian resume, therefore is typically longer than two pages. We will go more in depth on the things that should and need to be included in your federal resume later in this presentation, but make sure you're paying attention to the announcement. Some agencies do have page limits, Homeland Security Investigations, FEMA, and other Department of Homeland Security uh, agencies, for example. Though for most applications, your resume needs to be as long as it needs to be in order to show you have the qualifications and experience the agency is looking for. The next myth, that you must move to Washington, D.C. if you want to work in the federal government. The fact is only 15% of federal jobs are in the Washington, D.C. or D.C. metro area, while approximately 83% of federal jobs are found in multiple locations throughout the country, with the remaining 2% outside of the continental United States. Though for full disclosure, some agencies would like you to move to DC for a short time to do a rotation through the headquarters for development and promotion purposes. This is a myth that I've actually run into twice today, that resumes are scanned for keywords by an automated system. The fact is experience and research tells me that pe real people, real humans, human resource specialists will be the ones who review, rate, and score your resume. The only truly automated portion of the federal hiring process is when you're filling out your USA jobs information and self-assessment. The next myth, 
is that federal HR specialists will know what you did in the military if you're a veteran. The fact is, no, they will not. Veterans and transitioning service members, when developing your federal resume, you need to translate your skills and experience into terms civilian human resources specialists understand. Don't assume the reviewer knows what your service entailed or what skills and competencies you demonstrated, because they won't know. The next myth, jobs that close before the closing date means the agency had someone in mind, which caveats to another myth, you have to know someone to get a federal job or be promoted in the federal system. The fact is, you do not need to know someone to get a federal job or be promoted. If you are qualified for a federal position, you can write a competitive federal resume. Make sure you add as much context and detail when describing your knowledge, skills, and experience in your resume as possible, and answer the assessment questionnaire giving yourself all the credit that you can. You have to apply correctly following the directions. You can get best qualified and referred to a supervisor without knowing anyone in the government. But I will be honest and say networking, understanding the federal hiring process, asking for advice, getting your name out there is are all ways to ensure that you are in the know when opportunities pop up. When a job announcement closes before the closing date, this typically means that the agency received their limit of applications. Again, this happens when an agency knows they're going to be inundated with applications and there are only so many HR reviewers to go around. There are other myths, of course, that include a myth that military and civilian experience are different. The fact is all professional experience is experience. Where you got it doesn't matter. We will definitely hit this more later. Another myth is that you can't work for the federal government if you have a criminal record. This is absolutely false. People with criminal records are eligible to compete for the vast majority of federal jobs. During the hiring process, federal agencies are generally required to consider people with criminal records if they are among the highest rated candidates and can comply with the job requirements. There are, of course, some uh, excuse me, exceptions because of specific laws or statutes that prohibit employment depending on the crime committed. For example, certain federal laws, like those prohibiting treason, carry with them a lifelong ban on federal employment, other federal uh, laws that prohibit employment for a certain number of years, and then there are also restrictions upon carrying weapons, et cetera. I would drop into the chat or raise your hand. Has anybody else heard any other myths that they would like dispelled? Oh, I've got a white Georgina. Excuse me, Georgina, go ahead and come off mute. What what uh, rumor or myth have you heard? My son was actually told in his out processing uh, recently that he was not allowed to have a federal job for three years. And I quickly told him that, no, <laughs> that's your prime time to get in, kid. <laughs> Getting out of the military? Yes, sir. Yeah, whoever, well, and and not knowing any additional, you know, maybe he got in trouble, I'm not assuming anything, but mm -hmm. if if he if he's getting out under honorable conditions, that is absolutely not the case. We will go into this more, but he could technically start um, a federal career while he was on terminal leave. Yes, and yes, but that's one of the myths that they're actually, he was actually told in his out processing class, so it, it kind of blew me away. Interesting. All right. Uh, next, we've got uh, Clive Parkins. Go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking the question. It's it's more of uh, fact finding, um, appealing, appealing a hiring decision. I've heard that you can't appeal a hiring decision. Um, just wanted to know if that is true. And if so, if it's not true, how do you appeal? That is a great question, one that I do not have an answer to handy. However, um, you will have I will uh, share my contact information with you at the end of this presentation. If you could do me a favor and shoot me that question via email, um, I will work next week to try and find an answer to it. And then I will also pass that information on through LinkedIn as well as uh, to the post event um, post event survey or excuse me, post event email. Uh, one more and then we'll move on. Key win. Uh, yes, so I've heard that um, you have to have a security clearance for any type of federal role, but I think is not so much true. 
Um, we will get into that here in a minute. And thank you for that question. That's a great question because it is one of those ones that, you know, you have websites like clearancejobs.com and, and contractors that are always requiring clearances, things like that. Um, I'm probably going to say this anecdote twice just because I've got it written into the script. Um, for federal For federal jobs, if a federal job requires you to have a security clearance, they will investigate you even if you have a current clearance. The for instance I tell people is when I was active duty army, um, I retired in 21, sometime in early 20, I was re-adjudicated for a top secret clearance. I retired in 21, year later I got a job, federal job that required a top secret clearance. That top secret clearance had to be re-adjudicated within the federal system. Um, almost to an agency, unless they have reciprocity between them, for instance, DOD agencies, um, and a, an increasing number outside of DOD have reciprocity, but not all. Um, just anticipate that any uh, agency that you apply to, you will be reinvestigated. You'll have to go through the entire investigation process again. What does that mean? Is that Does that mean you can just blow off your current security clearance? No, absolutely not your current security clearance shows that if you do apply to a job that the federal agency shouldn't have an issue um putting you through uh the security process does that make sense yes awesome all right diving right into it first off everything we will discuss here is a way of doing things like most things, there is no single the way to complete, complete a federal resume. This isn't to scare you. I just want to manage your expectations. Um, some agencies like longer resumes. Some require a resume of a certain length. Some like narratives instead of bullets, but most will accept either. What we will discuss today are best practices that have generally been shown to work across the federal workforce. Bluff or bottom line up front. Your federal resume is your job application. It conveys your work history and experience to, potential, to a potential employer. It is used to determine minimum qualifications as well as the best and most qualified candidates. Your resume can be unlimited in length unless specified by the energy, excuse me, the agency. Um, the good rule to follow that I always do is that your resume needs to be as long as it needs to be in order for you to get the job. A federal resume must be written and tailored to the announcement and show specific and relevant, 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 relevant accomplishments and information. Relevant equals experience, knowledge, skills, and or training that applies to the job you're applying to. If it's not relevant, leave it out. There's a reason this gets its own slide. I know that when I started the process, meaning the federal hiring process, I included everything I did when I was in the service, no matter how small. While much of it could be seen as relevant, there was plenty that was not because of the career fields or professional experience level I was applying to. For instance, a federal agency won't care that I got my entire platoon to pass the physical fitness test at one point. But don't discount your experiences and achievements just because they appear irrelevant on the surface. Look deeper at what you did and adjust the context of your experience to include how you accomplished the task and what competencies you demonstrated while doing it. Planning, using computers to develop training, holding my employees accountable, finding ways to motivate them and demonstrating leadership and ultimately achieving success. These are the things that hiring managers want to see. The federal resume is your first and potentially only opportunity to impress the hiring manager. Your resume is the best method to market yourself to potential employers and must show how you meet the minimum qualifications and must include examples of how, when, and where you use the competency or skill. There's going to be something I repeat often here, and that is if it's not in your resume, it doesn't matter and doesn't count. It's not how you think you meet the qualifications. It's how your resume articulates how you meet the qualifications. This is a big one. Again, no one will assume what you did. You have to be clear about articulating what skills and competencies you demonstrated in the position. And when developing your federal resume, don't just go for the minimum qualifications. 
you want to add the context, detail, and metrics to get you rated as either very highly qualified, which means exceeds minimum qualifications, or best qualified, which means substantially exceeds qualifications. Foot stomp again. The rule is if it is not in your resume, it doesn't count. There are also some things that you can Oh, excuse me. There are also things that you should not have in your resume. For federal resumes, you do not want to include things like photographs or videos of yourself, any sensitive information or PII, which includes date of birth, marital status, age, or protected health information, social security number. Don't even put SSN. I've seen some several resumes recently that people put SSN and then they X out the, what is it, nine numbers or seven, uh, eight numbers. So don't even put SSN in your resume. As well as religious affiliation, but this is a tricky one. We will get into this one more later. This also includes LinkedIn or other social media profile links. Why? What's typically the first thing that pops up on a social media profile? Your picture. If you include any of this information under the do not include list, you will most likely be removed from consideration and will not be able to apply for the job. So where could you find information to put in your resume? Here are some examples, though this list is not all inclusive. Previous job descriptions and announcements are a good place to find information. For the veterans and or transitioning service members, in addition to your joint service transcript, you can also use your VMET or verification of military experience and training. Links to these sites will be included at the end of the presentation. And for any that have been out of the service for a minute, I actually checked my JST and VMET a year and a half after I retired and both were still active. Other places to get information for your resume include annual performance evaluations, end of course evaluations, course syllabus, etc. And don't forget any awards you received. Those should definitely go into your resume. If I raise a hands or type in the text box, where else can you or can you or should you pull information from for your resume? Seeing there are none, I'm going to answer this question that's in the text. Is it true that jobs usually go to those working in the federal government first, even if it says open to the public? That is a um, that is an interesting point. Current federal employees do have priority um, just because they are currently in the system, but it does depend on the job, how the job announcement is written. So that that is a yes, but it depends question charity. So I just wanted to make sure um you, i got that answer to you so i've got a danny acevedo go ahead come off where do you think it would be oh no i just want can you hear me i can okay sir um no thanks for uh taking my um my uh question but it's actually just a statement i, I think you can also use your your srb as um part of you know building your um your resume profile whatnot Oh, no, very good. Yeah, your SRB, your, your readiness brief, one of those things. Um, I like the joint service transcript because, as we'll see here in the next slide, um, it does explain in civilian terms what you did. So this, uh, moving on, this is actual an actual example from my own JST. Yes, while there is some jargon, adjutant general, soldiers, battalion, etc., there are still fairly significant parts of this that are written in civilian terms. Coordinating, planning, and synchronizing personnel support. Work as part of a team, providing personnel support and expertise. These are all things that are directly transferable into your resume. Evaluations are a great place to find achievements, but for those with military experience, you have to be sure to rewrite your experiences and achievements in civilian terms. 
Lisa Banks, to your question, I will not be sending this uh, particular slide deck out. However, there will be an after event email that has a list of resources that you can have, as well as a link to where this will be set up, uh, or excuse me, a link to where this recording will be posted on YouTube. Civilian and military course completion certificates, 1059s, et cetera, are also a great place and will typically include the skills, tasks, and competencies you are required to demonstrate in order to graduate that course. If you attended a course and that course required you to demonstrate certain competencies in order to graduate, make sure you put those competencies in your resume. Don't forget to include any experience you might have in leadership roles, in social or civic organizations, volunteer or other unpaid experiences, projects with your local schools or programs like 4-H, FFA, or booster clubs, projects like speaking engagements, or if you have writing credits. And don't forget any professional or academic challenges or successes you had while in college or in high school for those that are still young enough to be within that range. Up front, and I'll be on. Oh, there we go. Up front, and I'll be honest, I don't particularly like the USA Jobs Resume Builder because it's not as flexible as using a Word file. There are a bunch of templates out there. If you look online, um, I did send one out with the pre-event in email. That template is not required by any means. That is just an example and one that I use that I use in, uh, specifically. When considering what format to use, I recommend you find a format that allows you to best convey your information. But keep in mind that your resume still has to be clear and easy to read for the federal HR specialist who will review, rate, and score your resume. Again, if you still need one or you haven't received a pre-event email, feel free to reach out to me following this webinar and I will send you the format that I, again, that I use and recommend. Federal resumes do not need to be flashy. I recommend you keep your resume font the same font size, type, and color throughout. It should be black in color, 11 or 12 point, Arial, Times New Roman, or Garamond font. The use of capitalizations, bold print, and italics for subheaders and to highlight information is also a good idea. Things like text boxes, colors, and tables can actually take away from what you're trying to convey, and that is your experience. Additionally, these things can cause issues if someone exports your resume from PDF to Word or vice versa. Finally, read the fine print. Some agencies have different requirements like page length, if they accept non-USA job systems resumes, date formats, etc. Always read the entire announcement. And finally, no matter what recommendations you hear from me today or in general, always default to what the announcement is asking for. Um, Tracy, I'll answer that here in a second. Um, so moving on, things that you must include in your federal resume include your contact information, I call the introduction, your work experience, your education, your volunteer experience or any volunteer experience, any academic awards, achievements, or memberships, and then references. Um, plan on needing at least three professional references, and I will get into why later on. Your federal resume should also include relevant professional training, any relevant certifications, and for the veterans and transitioning service members in the audience, any relevant military schools. But with military schools, make sure you add a short summary of what you learned, the skills, competencies used, etc., because the agency probably will not know why you are including this if you don't tell them. Contact information of the introduction section should include your full name as listed on your records for any transgender folks in the audience. Please make sure to use your current name unless you have had it officially changed in your records. Next, your address. Pay attention to the announcement. Some agencies consider full street address PII and will remove you from consideration. Sometimes I recommend only including city and state, but make sure again you read the entire announcement. 
You want to have a good contact number, telephone number, so the agency can get a hold of you. When it comes to email addresses, you want to have an email address that you can carry with you after you leave the service or school. That is why I always recommend that you do not use a .mil or .edu email address. Um, get a civilian email address from Yahoo. I would say AOL or Hotmail, but those are antiquated. Gmail, you know, uh, Outlook, things like that. And try to stay away from the cute or rock star email addresses. Um, you know, these two are actually two email addresses that were on resumes that I have reviewed. Um, ultimately, a good lesson is to cre either create a jobs account, one that you have only uh, job related information going to, things like that. Um, I'll an Americruz, I'll answer that question later on in the presentation. As an example, this is my introduction section. You see here that I hit all of the requirements, but also put my own shine on things with the job number and title of the position I'm applying to at the top. This requires me to change at least one thing on every resume. You also notice that I don't have my citizenship listed. It's implied that you're an American citizen unless you put otherwise. So there's no point in wasting space and words if you do not. For those new to the federal hiring system, there are many special hiring authorities you can use that can give you a head start when applying. For veterans, when it comes to your resume, veterans preference and special hiring authorities are two separate things and serve two different purposes. I will discuss these more toward the end of our presentation. Language level proficiencies are um, good to include if relevant to the position you are applying for. If you want to put them, I recommend you use the State Department's definitions, which are commonly understood across the federal government. Current and active clearances aren't that important to the federal government, as we discussed earlier, since nearly every agency will reinvestigate you as part of their onboarding process. Include if including your, um, excuse me, including your clearance and adjudication date does show the agency that they shouldn't have any issues when or if you are reinvestigated by their organization. Again, make sure you read the fine print of the announcement and include everything the agency wants to see and nothing they don't. What are your questions on this topic at this time? I will, while everybody's thinking, I will go back to should you stay away from headers and footers? Uh, from Tracy, I would say yes. Um, the only thing I put in the header or footer of my resume is the page number. Um, regarding, uh, yeah, Mark Cruz, I'm going to hit this. This actually has a slide um, regarding the references at the end of the presentation. All right, no questions on what we've covered so far. Moving on. Uh, Rob, uh, let hold off on your question there, Rob. Let's uh, let's move a little bit farther into the presentation. I think I answer this question, but uh, hold on to it just in case I don't. All right, for the veterans in the audience, it is a myth that military and civilian experience are different. All professional work experience is work experience. This includes part-time and or unpaid volunteer experiences as well. You want to express that you have the specialized experience the agency is looking for. Saying that the experience was gained, quote unquote, in the military could make them think that your experience is limited only to that. You want the agency to know that you have the experience they want. Where you got it doesn't matter. Next, the recommended format. There are several ways to build a resume. The one that we'll discuss here is the same one used by USA Jobs and that is the reverse chronological order format, which puts your most recent experience first and then works backwards. Your resume should cover at least the last 10 years of work experience, but again, that is only a recommendation. If you can show you have the experience and, qualified, uh, and qualifications the agency is looking for within the last five years, you only need to go back five years. If you need to go back farther than 10 years to show you have the qualifications, then do so.
Um, so Amanda, um, DODID is still PII. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it unless, unless required by the announcement. Uh, LJ, we're going to get into that. That actually has an entire, uh, entire slide here in a second. All right. So building your federal resume with your work experience. Your work experience can be in bullet or narrative format. You need to figure out what is the best way for you to convey your experience. Make sure you include any jobs or volunteer activities you participate in, what you did, and the outcomes. And don't forget again, yeah, sorry. This is especially important when you, uh, if you have a part time gig um, that required you to demonstrate vastly different skills and competencies than your full time job. You want to get credit for what you did. And again, if it's not in your resume, it didn't happen. When developing your federal resume, each professional experience must include a job title for the military and veterans uh, uh, transitioning military and veterans out there. Civilians won't know what a sergeant major, NCOIC, watch NCO, commander, petty officer or staff sergeant is. You need to write in civilian terms. Try things like first line leader, project manager, program manager, senior instructor, organization administrative and logistics manager, etc. The employer's name is the only section in your resume for the veterans and transitioning, excuse me, transitioning service members that you should use military terms. For instance, the 102nd Transportation Company, NAVFAC or Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command or Bravo 152nd General Support Aviation Battalion because that is the organization you worked for. Next are dates. One of the reasons I'm not a fan of the USA Jobs Resume Builder is that it will only allow you to put month and year for your dates, but some agencies want month, day, and year and will actually toss your resume if you don't have them. Again, remember to read the entire announcement. Finally, the supervisor's name and phone number. You should absolutely include the supervisor's name and phone number, but don't be afraid to put no or contact me first as to whether or not the agency can and should contact the supervisor, but be prepared to answer why. This includes if you don't know your supervisor's phone number any longer, or maybe the company went away. Just be honest, be upfront, and state clearly why the agency will not be able to contact this person if it is an issue. Again, using this example from my resume, as a federal employee, I include both my pay band, series, grade, and step. However, with changes to the review process, this, uh, excuse me, the resume process, the salary is no longer used to determine qualifications and is optional. Since this is a federal position, I make sure to include this is a federal position statement underneath my uh, duty title. Um, note for the purposes of federal resumes, military service and government contracting positions are not considered federal positions. Another example from my resume, notice that I don't have this is a federal position. Again, that is because even though you might be or have been in the active duty military, you are not considered a federal employee when it comes to federal hiring. I've got a couple of questions in the chat box. Do you group military experience together? List command by command. Um, military experience and civilian experience are the same thing. I list them all together, all the way down chronologically, um, going backwards. So, um, LJ, uh, hopefully I answer your question. The references um, we'll get into later in this. And is there a list of common synonyms that, that will translate from military to federal? Uh, Georgina, if you receive the pre-event email, if you look on there, there should be a military to civilian translation guide with some information that hits that very topic. Another example from my resume. This example shows how you can add part-time or reservist or National Guard positions that run concurrent with your full-time job. Remember, the hours worked per week information here is considered typical. 
and should be an average of the hours you should have worked per week based on a typical month. It doesn't need to be 100% exact. For this example, since I was AGR or Active Guard Reserve, which means full-time National Guard, I also had a part-time traditional National Guard position with duties and responsibilities far different than my full-time position. Because I was active duty, I didn't get paid for my quote-unquote M-Day job, so I wanted to make sure the agency knows it by showing that the position was unpaid. For those that uh, with military experience who have been activated, put on orders for an extended period of time, deployed, etc., I recommend you include those as achievements in your experience, or if deployed for an extended period of time, make that deployment a completely separate experience block. It's up to you on what uh, time period or threshold might be, but for me, I would make a completely new experience block if something was six to nine months or more. Questions, I see one now. Will HR actually contact me regarding the request to contact me first about supervisor information? They will. Um, if you put contact me first, they will in fact contact you first if they are going to contact uh, your supervisor or need to contact your supervisor. Brittany asks, can you count duty days overnight work as part of a working hours? For example, standing duty on a ship every three to four days. Um, you can, it's up to you. We will discuss more on how to break down um, hours, uh, hours work per week here later, but it all com uh, comes down to how you want to convey your information. Before we go into detail on methods of writing quality experience bullets, let's talk some generalities. S a solid federal resume is about three things, detail, detail and detail. Your experiences need to include examples of what you managed, did, and or the tasks you completed, not what you were responsible for or what you assisted with. Your resume needs to describe the scope of your duties, how many employees you supervised, how much money you managed, were you a decision maker, as well as including examples when and where you can. It should include examples of your accomplishments, awards and recognition that you earned, as well as details and a summary of why you earned them. Try to use quantifiable metrics whenever and wherever possible. For instance, improved X percent by Y percent within Z months. What's the word I've used there a couple times? That's right, examples. If you're not going to give examples of how, when, where you use the competency or skill, you might as well have not even included that competency or skill in your resume. But what about upfront, nothing you include in a list of skills or in your summary or objective statement will count towards assessing your qualifications or qualifying your resume. Even though many templates and examples you see have these lists of skills, competencies, and or achievements, don't think you're gonna be able to hit the easy button and put all of these required competencies in one of these lists and have it count towards qualifying your resume. Even if you're using one of these templates, Make sure you're including and mentioning everything you have in these sections in your experience section with examples, with metrics, etc. Describe how you use the program or skill, in what environment, how often, if you were considered an expert or not. Did people come to you for advice on these matters or competencies? Were the reports you wrote for managers or senior executives? Were those reports used to make decisions? If you would like to include one of these summaries in your resume, keep it to about three to five sentences. Think of it like a smaller, more focused cover letter, giving the hiring manager some information that may not necessarily be relevant to the announcement, but something you feel that they should know. Your experience section is important when your experiences are connected to dates and hours worked. This information not connected to dates or hours worked is not important, and again, Anything you put into this section will not count towards qualifying your experience and your resume. Now, who has heard that you should copy and paste all of the specialized and required experience, competencies, etc., into your resume so that the resume scanning software will pick it up? Maybe you've been told to hide this info in white font so that the hiring manager won't see it just by a virtual show of hands. How many, uh, how many people have heard that? Yeah, I'm guessing a ton. 
you know, maybe maybe told you to do something like this. Up front, this doesn't work and won't get your resume as, uh, resume referred or assessed as qualified. Federal agencies don't use scanning software to re review and score your resume. A living person does it. And it's important to understand that if and when they see something like this, opposed to you showing how, when, and where you have the relevant experience that they're looking for, it's highly unlikely your resume will be rated as qualified, and it's impossible to imagine that your resume will be referred. Um, Eric, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I have heard that there is, a, um, I guess, a, a computer that actually pick up those keywords. Is that true? No, not in the federal government. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, and just just in case, because I wanted to make sure there's three. This is the third time I've mentioned it. The federal government does not use scanning software. They do not use it. The only scanning that's done is a live human person will control F on your resume to look for the applicable statements, um, qualifications, etc. Answer your question, Eric. Yes, sir. All right, I've got an uh, uh, Arlie. Arlie Holbrook, go ahead. No, Arlie? Arlie? No. Um, one more. I'm sorry, Jeff. sir. You just like beat up. No problem. Arlie, go ahead. No, I don't have any questions. Sorry. <laughs> No, no problem. All right, Jeff, you'll be the last one, and then I'll answer this one question uh, in the uh, text box. Jeff Paris. No, no question. I was just raising my hand for seeing the uh, about the um, the job scanning, the uh, resume scanning. They actually taught that at uh, at a federal resume writing workshop that I went to on base. That they you they use scanning software, huh? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Uh, I, I'll, uh, okay, that's a good question. I, I, I will double check it. None of the partners that I use, all of the federal HR professionals that I speak to, uh, state clearly and emphatically that they do not use scanning software. The only, the only automated part of the entire process, which we will get into here in a little bit, is when you do your self-assessment or your assessment questionnaire and you self-select out of the running. That's the only automated portion of this process. Um, but I, I will double check that because now you're the second person that's told me that people within the system are telling people you know, that are transitioning out or telling people that uh, they use scanning software. So I need to run that to ground to either confirm whether I'm wrong, because I don't want to be wrong, or to check people who are wrong because they're putting out bad information. Either way, either way, uh, so so let, let's re rewind for a second and just put out just directly. Again, if your resume just has words in it, that's not going to qualify your resume. So even if the federal government did use scanning software, it doesn't matter if those are just words in your resume. Without context, without examples, without, um, without giving some background of why that those words are important and how those words equate to what you did, how you did them, and when you did them, they're just words in your resume and won't count anyway. Make sense? Yeah, sure does. Yeah, no, I'm just, uh, yeah, this, that was just my most recent experience. And, and the, what the way they uh, justified it was because of the large, the, 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 the thousands of applications that come through on uh, particular jobs that it's, they, they made it sound like it's impossible to scan through all those with a human. Well, so that, as I stated earlier, that's also why many federal agencies are limiting the number of applications they are accepting. Yeah. So, um, so moving on. Um, so uh, again, Amanda, do other and uh, use it again. I will fit. I will double check this. But as of last week, when I held an in-person event that had NASA, Department of Labor, Homeland Security Investigations, the EPA, and the FDA all in the room, they all agreed that none of their organizations use scanning software. So um, I will I will double check to make sure this is good. Um, first or third person, 
Um, so from Mike Whitman, um, that is a great question. Whatever works for you. Um, I have heard third person is better to use, but if first person allows you to better convey your information, use first person. Um, again, these that is one of the things that is just recommended. It is not a hard and fast line. Um, from oh, JD, J-E-I-D-D-Y, um, I hope I said that right. Is it true that commanders can create GS position for someone they would like to hire? Um, also for a technical position, is it worth including section? So, um, so to your first point, I don't know. That would be an internal thing. Um, creating creating jobs, I, I I can't comment on that. I have been in the military where we had technicians and dual status technicians, and games may or may not have been played. But uh, whether that was the right answer, I don't know, and I don't want to comment on just for professional reasons. As for te technical positions, um, again. Any section that is not connected to dates or hours work per week are worthless. Um, we will actually get into this specific question later on in the presentation. All right, moving on again. Think of your federal resume as a test. It is the first of several challenges you need to overcome in order to become a federal employee. Every test has questions and understanding those questions can be key to passing or failing. For federal resumes, the test questions are made up of specialized experience, competencies, required training, if applicable, and the assessment questionnaire. First, without the requisite specialized experience as defined in the announcement, it is unlikely that you will be determined as qualified and referred to the hiring manager. The book definition of specialized experience is a type of work experience that is directly related to and relevant to the position you are applying. Next, sections in the job announcements, uh, job announcement that refers to how you will be qualified and evaluation factors and competencies are telling you the metrics that the federal agency are going to use when they grade your resume. When grading, the, ag the agency will determine how well your resume describes how, when, how often you have used the competencies the agency is looking for and how your skills and experience match those competencies. Next, you need to ensure that you have any and all required courses, college education or training if applicable. This section includes any special or specific schooling, education course requirements, certifications, etc. Finally, the assessment questionnaire selections you make should accurately describe your training and experience carrying out the task. We will go into each of these sections in detail, but first let's talk about a way to format your bullets and narratives to give maximum context and maximum effect. The experiences and examples in your resume need to paint a clear picture about how, when, and where you gain the experience and meet the qualifications the announcement is looking for. Human resource reviewers and hiring managers probably don't know what was involved in a project, task, or process, and they definitely won't make assumptions about your experience. When writing out your experience, again, think implied versus specified. The best answer is you must specify everything even the things you believe are in the implied category. What do I mean by implied versus specified? Let's take a look at the example of taking out the garbage. The specified task is take out the garbage. Implied with that would be remove the bag from the bin, walk to the front door, open the front door, go outside and identify a problem. Your kid's car is parked in front of the garbage can, so now explain how you utilize the cell phone contacted and verbally communicated with the individual laying out a course of action in order to solve the problem how you solve that problem, which then allowed you to walk to the garbage can, open the garbage can, put the bag in the garbage can, close the lid, return to the house, closing the front door, and replacing the bag in the bin. When describing what you did, you should be as clear and detailed as that. And don't just include how, when, and where, but also the skills you used. Maybe you used another skill like oral communication. If you did, make sure you state whether or not you expressed information to individuals or groups effectively. And, your re and were your presentations clear and convincing? Why? Because this is what the definition of oral communication is asking for. 
don't just say written communication skills, but include whether or not you have been recognized for writing in a clear, concise, organized, and convincing manner for the intended audience, which ties it back to the mosaic definition, which we will talk about here in a few. Don't just say you worked with computers. Get detailed. Describe if you use Microsoft Office suites, such as Excel, PowerPoint, whether you manipulated spreadsheets. Don't just include that you did them, but also include how often. Did you do it daily, weekly, routinely as part of your job? For our veterans and transitioning service members out there, writing in civilian language means avoiding militarisms and jargon. But this includes those who are looking to chain job series or federal agencies. For current federal employees, it's important to avoid agency specific or office jargon. When you're applying to another office or agency, you need to be able to translate those things to something HR reviewers and managers understand no matter their background. I've stated it before and will again several more times. You want the agency to know that your experience is experience where you got it doesn't matter. This is the same with acronyms. Use them sparingly, if at all, and always spell them out at least once. Finally, when it comes to numbers, I recommend either spelling, spelling out the numbers, the words, or writing out all the zeros. For instance, 35 million with six zeros has way more of a wow impact than just 35M. When defining your role, state the facts. Did you work on your own as part of a team, as a supervisor? Did you manage supervisors? Don't just say you assisted with, but describe in detail what you did. Go beyond just listing your job responsibilities by using accomplishments and examples to highlight the results of your work experience. Again, avoid jargon when describing your duties. Use civilian terms when describing your organization. For the military folks, instead of brigade, try an organization over, of over 2,000 personnel, or use terms like agencies, directorates, or offices. Avoid military-only organization titles like battalions, squadrons, or wings. When developing your resume, it should reflect clearly the professional level you worked at. It should paint a clear picture as to whether or not you are a doer or a policymaker. Your bullets or narratives need to show how you have either entry, middle, senior, or executive level experience depending on the announcement. Before we go into detail on how to find the specialized experience competencies, et cetera, and then what to do, let's take a moment to touch on a couple of techniques to help capture and articulate your experience to maximize effect. If you want to format your bullets and narratives to help add context to your experience, I recommend using the PAR, P-A-R, or STAR, S-T-A-R, methods as a template. Doing this not only gives you a strong format for your experience, but it will give you practice for your future interviews, where it is strongly recommended that you respond to the behavioral or situational interview questions using the STAR method. We'll start with the PAR method, or P-A-R. PAR stands for problem, which is the situation, the issue. This sets the context. The action, this is, covers what you did, what steps you took, what lessons you learned. Finally, the result. This is the so what of the bullet. It is recommended that you include numbers and metrics as often and wherever possible. This is an example of a resume bullet using the STAR method to, to develop it. And I know we discussed this earlier, this is written in the first person. So, and again, this is from my resume. So apparently I have used the first person before. The STAR method is also, the, again, the recommended method for answering behavioral interview questions you will face during the eventual interview. It is a good habit to start writing, thinking, and speaking in those terms now. STAR stands for situation or background. This is the broader context of the situation. The T stands for task, the problem to solve, the challenge, the goal to reach, or the tasks to complete. This adds even more focused context for the reader. 
A, actions, again, your actions that include the steps taken to complete or achieve the goal, the skills used, or an explanation of your process. And finally, the results. This can include how you contributed, benefited, or improved your organization, how you used Well, that was fun. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> uh, let me bring back. All right. What was the last thing I was talking talking about uh, results, correct? Eric, I'm looking right at you. Can you give me a north south if uh, that's what I was talking about? Cool. Thank you. The only dude still on uh, the only dude still on video. So I'm, I'm looking at I'm taking my cues off of you. Yo, uh oh, better come off video now. All right, so results. Uh, again, uh, developed process. Well, results can include how you contributed, benefit, or improved your organization, how you used or developed a process, or what important lessons you learned or skills gained throughout through the outcome. Again, the results should include as many metrics as possible. Here's another example using the star method to develop a resume bullet. I'm not going to read the whole thing since it's really long, but you will see that it hits all four S T A R. I'm going to do my best not to get flabbergasted by this. Uh, this out of left field thing. But how do you locate the specialized experience within the announcement? Most USA Jobs webinars and classes will explain what is meant by specialized experience, so I don't want to go too in depth on this one. However, here are examples from this particular announcement. Take a look at the first line on the page. You must have one year of specialized experience equivalent to at least the le next lower grade GS11 in this case. This means your resume must not only show you have the experience that the agency is looking for at the grade you're applying to, but also must show you would have met the time and grade requirements for the next lower position or grade. How do you make sure you're meeting this requirement? By ensuring your entire resume to include past positions is it tailored to the announcement you are applying to. Neglecting, excuse me, neglecting this is the reason most people receive those do not meet the minimum requirements for this position emails. I know this is me. This was absolutely me. The first 60 applications that I posted uh, when I was applying. So I will discuss this more in a minute. So remember the first required specialized experience. You must have one year of specialized experience at the level of difficulty and responsibility equivalent to GS 11 grade level in the federal service. We remember that this is where most people get derailed because they spend all of their time writing to the current position and then neglect to ensure all of their past positions show the applicable growth and qualifications required by the announcement. Many announcements will lay out what experience looks like at the next lower level, but many don't. This means researching what experience looks like at the next lower level. OPM has an entire library on competencies and skills at various levels and within certain career series. You can also gain insight from looking at lower level positions within the same agency or job series on USA Jobs. The slide here shows a short example of how to show progression in your resume. For instance, the current bullet position requires you to write policies for an organization. Your most recent past position bullet 
must must show how you enforced policies for the organization. But back to the must have one year of specialized experience. How do you make sure you have this re requirement? By making sure your employment dates are correct. Um, Lisa, I get into that later on. So again, by making sure your employment dates are correct. All computations of your work experience start with the dates you are in the position. Without knowing how many weeks per year and hours per week you did something, a federal HR specialist cannot, 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 and will not determine your qualifications. In the federal government, 52 weeks is an important benchmark. For Fed folks, 52 weeks of experience equals 52 35 to 40 hour work weeks. This is why the reviewing HR professional needs to know your employment dates, your exact employment dates. Don't think you're getting away with anything by only putting your month and year for your employment dates. Putting January 2020 to December 2020, for instance, on your resume will not get you assessed as a full year or 52 weeks of experience. It will get you assessed at 44. Why? Because federal HR personnel default your start date to the last date of the month and your end date to the first. So by putting January 2020 to December 2020, you basically put down January 31st, 2020 to December 1st, 2020, which equates to 44 weeks. Even if you left mid-month, you want to get credit for the time you worked, which brings us to hours worked per week. In order for you to be assessed as having 52 weeks time and grade or 52 weeks of full-time experience, the agency needs to know how many hours a week you worked. The federal government has determined full time means anywhere from 35 to 40 hours a work week. Putting anything less means your experience won't be graded as full time. What about for those of you that may have worked more than 40 hours a week, like it was asked earlier? If your normal duties require you to work more than 40 hours a week on occasion, say so. But say it is an achievement, not a normal thing. Why? Because we as federal agency and federal hiring officials understand you may have worked 60 hours a week, but what were you scheduled to work? If under 60 hours a week, put what you should have been working, say 40, and then put as a bullet how you routinely worked additional hours in order to ensure the success of the organization's mission. Back to the example. What if you don't have 52 weeks of required experience like in the first example? Here we see that the applicant will only be at credit, excuse me, the applicant will only get credit for 24 weeks of experience, but needs 52 weeks of experience in one of the specialized experiences required for the job. For many of us, we often do similar things in every job. You may have conducted quarterly performance evaluations in multiple positions, or maybe use certain management skills, technical or computer skills, report writing skills, etc. It's important to include what you did in every experience that you did it. It doesn't matter if you are duplicating your experience bullets if you did it. If you did something in more than one experience, include it in both. By included conducted quarterly excuse me, by including conducted quarterly performance evaluations in both positions shown on the screen, this resume gets assessed at having 104 weeks of experience in conducting quarterly performance evaluations. If you're shooting for more than just meeting the minimum qualifications, this is how you do it. Questions? I see translating civilian experience into GS levels, um, moving from civilian to government employment. Um, we'll get into that here in a little bit, Lisa. Are there any questions about what we've gone over so far? I've got one. Arlie, go ahead. I have a question for the uh, ladder positions. Uh, will that work the same, even though like you have been doing the same job because it's a ladder? Like for example, I'm on a one to the seven to twelve, and I've been on the twelve for forty-seven weeks. Uh, will that take the time back since I was like higher over there, or how does it work? I'm sorry, I might it might be. My uh, my connection. I didn't really catch what you asked. Could you do me a favor at the end? I'll uh, you'll get my email. Could you send me an email with uh, exactly w what the problem is or what your question is? And I'll be sure to answer it. I just I I want to make sure that the uh, connection is good and I get your full question. 
Copy. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. So now we have an idea about how to make sure our dates are correct and why, as well as to show context within our experience by using the PAR or STAR methods. Let's look at how to use the specialized experience in the announcement to add even more clarity to our resume bullets and narratives. Let's take a look at the specialized experience preparing presentations, white papers, and reports for personnel at all levels. Uh, take a moment, think about your own work experience, and see if you can come up with a potential resume bullet meeting this requirement. Here's an example. From this example, we see that the applicant did address preparing presentations, how often they did it, as well as the levels that they presented to. The applicant explained what systems and applications they used, as well as how they both wrote and verbally briefed the information. From this bullet, I see the person has technical competence, experience with oral and written communication, experience using Microsoft Office products, as well as experience speaking to employees, managers, and executives. This seems like a really great bullet, but there is something very important missing. What is it? Numbers. There you go. This bullet is purposefully missing quantifiable metrics. What was improved by all this? How much? How long did it take? This bullet is missing the so what of why it was included in the resume. It's missing the results. Yep, numbers, perfect. Next, we're going to discuss how your resume will be graded and why knowing this is important. Reading through the announcement, you are told something to the effect of, you will be evaluated on the basis of your level of competency in the following areas. These areas within the federal government are also called competencies. Most announcements will be different, so these are only examples. So based on these competencies, in this announcement, what is this announcement looking for? What do they mean? What does the agency want? What is adaptability? What is problem solving? Can anybody, uh, anybody venture a guess? No, that's all right. I didn't know either. So OPM lists the definitions of their competencies in the FWCI and Mosaic Competency Library found in the back of the OPM Federal Workforce Competency Initiative <clears throat> FWCI Competency Handbook. Oh, that's a long way of saying that one of the things the federal government also does right is every agency, every federal hiring official, every federal hiring manager, every HR department uses the exact same agent or exact same competency descriptions. So no matter what agency you're applying to, the agents or excuse me, the competency definitions will remain the same. Using this guide, you will find the meaning of the competencies that you'll be graded against so that you can then use those definitions to help write your experience bullets and narratives. What do I mean? Well, for this competency, the Mosaic Guide lists the definition as identifies problems, determines accuracy and relevance of information, uses sound judgment to generate and evaluate alternatives and to make recommendations. What could a bullet look like? How about something like this? Here, our imaginary, our imaginary applicant has included this bullet. Evaluated business practices, pro, uh, processes devoted to scheduling, as well as an analysis of workflows, value-added impact, and utility derived from a cost-benefit analysis. Coordinated with regional IT team, provided guidance and directed the development of regional scheduling system for scheduling of three HSPD 12 sites across California. Results, an increase in customer service receiving no negative customer service experience or CSX comments while in the position and the scheduling system being adopted by two other EPA regions. So by a quick uh, raise a hand or thumbs up, does our bullet match what the competency is looking for? Again, the competency was identifies problems, determines accuracy and relevance of information, uses sound judgment to generate and evaluate alternatives, and to make recommendations. Does this look, look kind of right? Yeah, good. Oh. 
So before we move on, are there any other questions about competencies? Nope, I got one. Clive Parkins, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Brock. How do you give a score to that versus somebody else's uh, bullet? How do I give a score to it? Um, so I don't, I'm not an HR reviewer, so I don't score this. Um, however, um, as as people, uh, should comps be the current level bill? Um, so, sorry, squirrel moment. Um, so how things are scored, pull the curtain back, look at the, uh, you know, the federal hiring process. How these things are scored is a federal HR reviewer is given a list. You know, if this, then this, if this, then this, if this, then this, if they have these certain statements, this level of experience, they get scored at this level. Um, so I, I don't have access to that. Those are actually pretty proprietary and FOUO within the federal government. They don't just give them out, even for federal employees. Um, so that's kind of close hold within the HR realm. So I, I honestly have never seen one um, other than seeing one, you know, someone kind of flashing it to me on, on camera or, or being right there in their office. Does that, did that answer your question? Cool. Um, should competencies be for the current level or the level below? Your your resume needs to be written to show that you have the competencies in every experience section that you have. If, if for instance, uh, Amanda, an agency is wanting, is wanting to know your experience with regards to attention to detail, you need to show how you have attention to detail detail in your current position, as well as all your past positions. Your entire resume has to be tailored to the announcement that you're applying to. Did that answer your question? Oops, no, good to go. All right, moving on, the assessment questionnaires. They measure your expertise in job related tasks and are used to screen and evaluate applicants. This assessment allows candidates to self identify their relevant experience. These self report questions are carefully developed to identify specific behaviors, education and experience that will separate good candidates from great ones. Most announcements include a link that allows you to preview the assessment questionnaire prior to applying. These are a couple of examples of how to preview your assessment questionnaire. Up front, most assessment questionnaires are different. What we will go over here is an example taken from USA Jobs. Here is, here is an example of some of the questions you'll be answering, what they look like. Remember what I said about a test? Another example of a format you may find. This example requires you to select everything you have experience with that is applicable to the job you're applying for. If you select something, guess where else that information needs to be? Your resume. There are several other ways that the assessment questionnaire will ask you about experience. Some will ask you to input examples. Others will ask you for dates and job titles. Remember, you have to include everything the announcement and assessment questionnaire are looking for in your resume. Back to the assessment questionnaire. Assessment questionnaires are also called self assessments. This is where you get to select how well you think you qualify for the job. So by a quick show of virtual hands, who has heard that no matter what, you should always choose expert or the highest rating possible? Yeah, I got a North South America. Yeah, a couple. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that is another myth. Fact, if you inflate your qualifications and or experience, for instance, your resume doesn't support your answers on the assessment questionnaire, you may be removed from consideration for the position. At a minimum, your self-assessment will be downgraded and your entire resume may be put at the back of the application pile. So make sure you rate yourself accurately and honestly. Um, Alita, yes, we just went over how to go over that. There are um, links. I'll go back to it real quick so you can see them. There are links. They look like what's currently on the screen in the announcement. There are different ways you may have to read through it. 
there are a couple different ways that they're um, they're shown within the announcement, but there is a way to preview the questions before you start the actual application process. Back to where we were. All right. From here, we're going to go over an example of what should be reflected in your resume based on your self-assessment selection. This isn't the only way to do it, nor is it the only format the questions come in. Bottom line, no matter what the assessment questionnaire is asking for, your resume must reflect the answer you select. So let's think about this question. Researching, analyzing, and developing reports, data tools, and providing training and leadership. Based on this question, Let's see ways your resume should look based on potential answers. For this format of assessment question, we will have the five choices. A, B, C, D, E, starting with A, you have had no education. B, you have had education and training, but you haven't worked the job. C, you've performed the task kind of. D, you've performed this task as a regular part of your job. And E is basically the expert. So let's move on. So since um, it is unlikely Oh, and I, I jump ahead. I did. It's unlikely that you're going if you select A or B, you'll be qual or select, uh, rated as qualified for the position. So we're going to jump right to C. So with this selection, you must start adding more information to your resume bullets here. We can see that the individual has some experience, but not a ton. Up front, do not be afraid to pick this selection if it's accurate. Here we have even more detail and context. Don't be afraid to use the words from the assessment questionnaire. Just don't copy and paste them. Use them in terms of your experience, your knowledge, your training, where and when you gain the experience. Finally, the expert selection. How could this bullet read? Notice that the examples are getting longer and longer. That's what detail and context looks like. Again, for this example, I left out things that could make this bullet even stronger. That is the quantifiable metrics. I don't want you guys stealing my bullets, so get your own. <laughs> I don't know how better to foot stomp this other than maybe this. If you're not sure about what to select when working through the assessment questionnaire, select the next lower choice. That way, if the HR reviewer sees that you are actually more qualified than you give yourself credit for, they will increase your self rating at no penalty to you. If you do select something and it turns out that it was too low and you basically self selected out of the running, then maybe that job wasn't meant for you or your resume needs to be fixed. Now that you've got an idea of what we're talking about, let's dive into and make sure we're clearly detailing our experience and hitting the announcement requirements. Again, when developing your experience bullets, you wanna avoid using agency, career field, or military specific jargon. You also want to avoid terms like helped, worked, or assisted with, or terms like I have experience with. These are all nebulous and actually don't say anything. Instead, clearly state what you did, what tasks you completed, and were those tasks key to the successful completion of the mission? Did you improve anything, change anything, or better anything? What specific skills, abilities, and or attributes did you employ to complete the task? What equipment or software did you use? You need context and detail. Again, avoid terms like responsible for and served as because they don't tell the hiring manager what you did or achieved. Instead of responsible for, try managed or completed X number of tasks or similar action verbs that embody initiative. Also, don't just say major duties included or currently I am working on. 
This assumes that the reviewer knows what your position entails or knows that you actually accomplished the duties that you were supposed to complete. They won't. Again, state clearly that you did X, Y, and Z. Did I mention that you need to avoid jargon when describing what you did? I strongly recommend listing college education, certifications, and any military education, as well as other training separately. Pay attention to the announcement. Understand whether education will be a major factor or not in determining qualifications. Don't shortchange yourself just because you don't have a full degree yet. Many jobs are looking for experience and transferable skills that are communicated in the resume. Although it is good to address education on the resume, if you, you need to be conscious of whether or not that education will be a deciding factor or not, so you don't have to be as detailed if it isn't. Volunteer experience is an important section that can add a lot to your resume. Volunteer experience is any unpaid experience you might have and can include work done through national service programs such as the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps or work for community based philanthropic and social organizations like churches, schools, etc. This can involve uh, this can include involvement in programs like 4-H, FFA or your child's school or booster club. Volunteer experience can show critical competencies, knowledge and skills you might have beyond your professional experience and provides valuable training and experience that translates directly to your resume. Now there's something I wanna to touch on that may seem contradictory to what I said earlier. One of the things that you need to avoid in your federal resume is stating your religious or religion affiliation. How does that compare with stating that you do volunteer at your, at your church? Simple. It's not your church. It's a church you volunteer at. Understand that you know, if anybody doesn't understand the difference, please let me know. You try to avoid stating that you did something or volunteered for something at your church versus you volunteered at X church to do X thing and these are the things you did. So avoid stating that that is your church, that you are a member of the congregation, et cetera, and just simply put what you did, what competencies you held, and what experiences you gained through that task or event. When adding volunteer experience, you need the name of the organization and location, exact dates of each period, number of hours worked per week, as well as a brief description of what you did, roles, and accomplishments. All this looks familiar, right? That's because volunteer experience is experience. I have also seen separate sections for affiliations as well as seen resumes where ex the volunteer experience is included inside the normal resume and experience section. It's all how you want to do it. Like the previous slide, agencies don't care about your professional training unless that training taught you something that applies to what they're looking for and they typically won't unless you tell them. Same can be said for certifications. Relevant certifications should be included in your resume. For the veterans, agencies don't care about most military schools unless they taught you something that applies and is relevant to the announcement that they have posted, and they typically won't know unless you tell them. Make sure you only list again the relevant military education and training because most federal agencies probably don't care what basic training you went to. Award sections are good to include if you have the room, but make sure you include a statement about any awards or decorations in your experience, which will then give your experience more context and detail and push your resume beyond just meeting the minimum qualifications. I know there's a question earlier about references. So references are an optional section normally, unless specified by the announcement. Pull the curtain back of the federal hiring process. A federal agency must speak to three references at a minimum in order to hire you. Me personally, I like trying to take as much time off the 
in already incredibly long federal hiring process as possible. So by including references with my resume when I submit it, that the federal agency now doesn't have to take time to come get me, contact me to get a list of references before they can start um, checking your references. So that's again, that's just me. Make sure you uh, ultimately always defer and default to what the announcement says and calls for. Um, CCAF degree, what is that? From Maggie. So it's your community college Air Force degree. So um, it's ultimately your degree from the Air Force um, in regards to whatever your AFSC is. So your job within the military. So so that that's your MOS basically. A military <laughs> occupational specialty. It would be in the Army, right? Right, right. Yes. So but it's an that, actual, actual degree that you get um, that from yeah. like doing classes and stuff for. Is it, a, is it an associate's, bachelor's, master's, or doctorate? Associates, yes. Okay, then absolutely. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. See, learn something new every day. I didn't even know that was a, that was a thing. Um, so uh, who do we got? I I see a hand up. Who's got their hand up? Um, Tori, go ahead. No, it wasn't me. I apologize. Sorry. Uh, no worries. Brian Kovac, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I have a quick question, and this is kind of a pretty loaded two part question, so we can we can chat another time if it's too long. But question one is um, you talked about meeting the lower in time and grade requirements like if you're trying to like I'm trying to pivot from corporate sales into procurement or HR. Uh, I'm also okay. trying to leverage my master's degree, so I don't have experience in either of those two fields, but there's a lot of transferable skill sets coming from sales. How would you or somebody like myself coming from like, for example, there's, you know, isn't a sales job in the government, but procurement's very close and so is HR. So if somebody let's just forget about sales, somebody's trying to leverage their experience from the corporate sector or the private sector into a government job, it doesn't have direct experience by has you know transferable skills or and or the second part is that is how do you leverage the time and grades you said i understand you have to work your uh each uh job you've had to kind of build up to to that level as you said but how can you do that if you've never done that job but if you but you've had transferable skills so my my thought would be to leverage education like how, i guess does that make sense it it does. So so here's kind of a long slash short way of answering your question. Ultimately, if you can art, cannot articulate how your knowledge training experience matches the required experience from the app job announcement, you're probably not going to get hired. So that's the, that's kind of the bottom line up front. Now now unpacking some of the stuff you said, having a master's degree with some agencies that is a requirement for or the um, it is a education requirement that can be substituted for experience up to GS9 level, right? So that that's great if you're looking at GS9. Okay. But if you want higher than GS9, now you're gonna have to start looking at some sort of mixture of experience and quali uh, experience qualifications and education. So it, it's gonna be announcement, it's gonna, I hate to say this, I don't like giving such vague answers, but it's gonna depend on the agency and the announcement. That's fair enough, okay, that helps. Okay, and what was your second question? No, that was that was pretty much it. <laughs> gotcha. OK, um, so Mara Cruz, we're going to discuss Schedule A stuff here in a minute. Um, yeah, so moving on, I know somebody had a question about this earlier for our veterans and transitioning service members on the call. Our military to civilian translation guide is available on LinkedIn, uh, not on Facebook, so I need to delete that little part of my thing. Um, if you can't find it or would like to contribute, feel free to email me and I will email you a copy. Um, while this is focused towards the military, it is also important to understand that jargon exists in all agencies, organizations, and career fields. And what one agency or career field calls a skill or is looking for could be called something completely different in another. That's why even as potentially current federal or state employees that you write your resume in clear, easy to understand terms for the agency you are applying to. Here are just some examples from our guide uh, for the military and veterans folks, because I love pointing these out. 
We've all heard it and I've heard and I've said it here several times. Your resume must be written in a language that HR resume reviewers understand. The person reviewing your resume probably has no idea what the job is that you're looking, uh, excuse me, what the job is looking for, only what they're being told to review. And the likelihood that the HR reviewer will understand what you did in the military is probably in the less than 1% range. This is why resumes must clearly state how you meet the qualifications for the positions in terms the HR reviewers and managers understand. You know, again, military experience, experience is just professional experience. Army, Navy, Marine Corps um, are not things. However, departments of the Department of Defense, the Department of the Army, and the Department of Navy are. MOS, Military Occupational Specialty, or your CCAF, Career Field, Specialty, Job Duties. What is a mission other than a project, task, function, or objective? Here's some more examples from our guide. So this bottom one is one of my favorites, Close Air Supporter, CAS. What could be a way of translating this very specific combat related military term into something a federal HR specialist or even civilian corporate HR specialist can understand? Any, any volunteers? What would be a good way to translate this? Oh, no, no one wants to come up, huh? Well, here's a way. What about this? Well, clo yeah, close air support. Close air support means dropping bombs on bad guys. Senior technician, that's a good one. Shannon, but how about customer service? I know some of you laugh. I've actually seen a couple of you laugh, uh, but let's look at the definition of customer service before we kind of poo poo this definition and equivalence. So the definition of customer service in the Mosaic Guide from the Office of Personnel Management reads, works with clients and customers, that is any individuals who use or receive the services or products that your work unit pr produces, including the general public, individuals who work with the agency, other agencies or organizations outside the government, to assess their needs, provide information or assistance, resolve their problems, or satisfy their expectations, knows about available products and services, is committed to providing quality products and services, uh, yeah, and is committed to providing quality products and services. So, seems like this translation hits pretty close to home since remembering my time in Iraq, close air support absolutely solved some of my problems. As we get closer to the end of our presentation, and I'm now just realizing that we did not break at the halftime, but that's all right. I would like to add these um, these following closing tips and reminders. Context matters. Explain what you did, how you did it, and if it made a difference. If it's not in your resume, then you didn't do it. Only include relevant information. It doesn't matter if you think it's relevant or not. It only matters if the agency thinks it's relevant or not, and they are telling you what they find is relevant because that will be in the announcement and the supplemental or assessment questionnaire. For every bullet in your resume, ask yourself, so what? What is its purpose? How does it strengthen your resume and or reflect the specialized experience the announcement is looking for? Again, if it's not in your resume, then you didn't do it. I recommend creating one master resume as a foundation and then tailor it to each announcement. A master resume allows you to put everything all of your experience, no matter the job series, MOS, background, et cetera, into one document. Personally, personal anecdote, creating a master resume cut my application time down from usually anywhere from three to four hours, because I'm pretty detail oriented, to less than one. So now in an afternoon, if I want to apply to a job, instead of spending four hours on one resume, developing it, tailoring it, getting it good to go, and then submitting it, now I've got time to be able to apply to four jobs. When it comes to it, you know, quality over quantity, but you definitely need the quantity to get there. Next, state the facts. Do not exaggerate. Avoid jargon and militarisms. And that, again, this isn't just for the vets. This is also important for current federal employees or folks trying to transfer agencies or applying for a different position in a different career field. Next, use acronyms sparingly, if at all, 
and be sure to spell them out at least once per experience section. Next, your resume needs to go as far back as you need to in order to show you have the experience and qualifications the announcement is looking for. However, you do not need to go all the way back to your military experience for the veterans in the audience in order to qualify for your veterans preference and veteran special hiring authorities. Next recommendation is find a mentor, pick their brain. There are some great private organizations out there um, like Veterati, Four Block, Hire Heroes USA, etc. Finally, your resume must be clear. HR reviewers will not make any assumptions about your experience. If it's not in your resume, it didn't happen. Now we had some questions about hiring authorities. For the veterans, when it comes to your resume, veterans preference and special hiring authorities are two separate things and serve two different purposes. Veterans preference gives eligible veterans preference and appointment over many other applicants. In the competitive service, for instance, the federal system, when agencies use a numeric rating and ranking system to determine the best qualified applicants for a position, an additional five or 10 points are added to the numerical score of qualified preference eligible veterans. Veterans preference does not guarantee veterans a job, and it does not apply to internal agency actions such as promotions, transfers, assignments, and reinstatements. I will level with you. As a 24-year Army retiree, I have never used veterans preference within the federal government, even though I've been hired by the federal government twice. Special hiring authorities, also known as hiring paths, help the federal government hire individuals that represent a diverse society. These special hiring authorities can be used to give you a head start when applying. It's best to think of each path as a route to the hiring manager. If you're serious about securing a federal career, you want to put your resume and application on as many of those paths as possible to increase your chances of being hired. Special hiring authorities includes veteran specific paths like the Veterans Recruitment Appointment or VRA and the 30% or more disabled veteran special hiring authority as well as other hiring authorities for recent graduates, individuals with disabilities, uh, where to go, and or the Schedule A Special Hiring Authority, authorities for military spouses, as well as authorities for Peace Corps and AmeriCorps alumni. Now, before we continue into the non-competitive hiring authorities, I wanna to touch bases on the limitations of one authority in particular, which will answer your, um, your question. Uh, Jetty, is that how you pronounce your name, Jetty Lopez? GD? Yay, Haiti. Okay, that's cool. Uh, I don't like messing it up. People keep calling me Brooke, and I'm like, that's my daughter's name. Um, so, but anyway, so the reason, the reason is, so, that, well, and the reason I didn't use it is because of this right here. So, the uh, hiring authority in particular I want to touch on is called the Veterans Employment Opportunity Act of 1998, or the VEOA. The definition of the VEOA is a special hiring authority which gives eligible veterans access to positions that otherwise may have only been available to current competitive service employees. Again, competitive service employees means federal employees. In VEOA appointments, preference eligibles and veterans are not given preference. There it is right there. But they are allowed to compete for job opportunities that are not offered to other external candidates. This means that even though veterans and active, so now, uh, off of their definition, this means that even though veterans and active duty service members aren't technically considered federal employees, the VEOA, uh, the VEOA allows us to compete for jobs that are only open to current or previous employees. What everyone, including myself, uh, I needed to be made aware of is that using the VEOA typically means, one, my resume will always get referred, no matter what, even if you barely meet the minimum qualifications. Now, some of you are thinking this is good, right? No. When I started applying to federal jobs, seeing my federal resume referred kept me from doing that internal, internal look to see if my resume was even worth, worth a darn. It kept me from realizing that my resume wasn't anywhere near what the agency and HR professionals were looking for. So I kept using my burnt garbage resume to get to apply, get referred. Apply and get referred, apply and get referred, apply and get referred. Now translate this over 60 times. 
It wasn't until I took the time to dig into my resume and really become introspective and take a look at what the agencies actually wanted to see in my resume that I realized that the VEOA only allowed me to compete with current and former federal employees for the positions. It didn't offer me any preference or entitle me to a job, which of course is right there in the VEOA verbiage on OPM's site. Even if you are eligible for and use the VEOA, your resume still needs to be on point, meet all of the qualifications required by the announcement and the assessment questionnaire, and show that you are the best candidate for the position. You are still competing for the position. The VEOA is not a shortcut for veterans. It just opens up more doors and opportunities for us. So for those who keep getting referred and have been using the VEOA but haven't been getting interviews, this may be why. So Haiti, um, Haiti, did that answer your question? Cool. Back to special hiring authorities, which some are also known as non-competitive hiring authorities. But what about the points? Again, the points are only the points are only counted if veterans' preference is taken into account. If veteran's preference is not taken into account, veteran's preference points are not added to your score. The veteran's preference and veteran's, the veteran's preference and the five or 10 points veteran's preference points are not mandatory depending on the job announcement. So again, that's another important thing to read the entire job announcement because the announcement will say whether or not veteran's preference is allowed. Back to the special hiring authorities. Using one of these authorities means anyone who meets the minimum eligibility for the position can be selected so long as they qualify for one of the applicable special hiring authorities. Um, we, the, at the time, San Francisco Federal Executive Board and the Veterans Federal Employment Collaborative, and that uh, I got a little click happy, my apologies. Um, <laughs> Hiring pass, 30%, 30% uh, or more. Sorry, scrolling, 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 scrolling. All right, here we go. So, uh, using a so long as the call. So, the, we, the San Francisco Federal Executive Board and the Veterans Federal Employment Co Collaborative, help, have helped more than 50 people get hired to positions that did not even have open announcements on USA Jobs using the Individuals with Disabilities and the 30% or more disabled veteran non competitive special hiring authorities. So I want to focus on these two for a moment. While the Schedule A and 30% or more disabled veteran hiring authorities may look similar, they are different. And that is why I will always recommend that veterans who are eligible or who have even a 0% rating from the VA also try to see if they are eligible for the Schedule A special hiring authority. Why? The 30% or more disabled veteran authority allows an agency to non-competitively appoint any veteran who has 30% or more service-connected disability. You're eligible if you have separated from the active duty military service with a service connected disability rating of 30% or more, or have a rating by the Department of Veterans Affairs showing a com compensable service connected disability of 30% or more. Sounds great, but this authority can only be used once you're out of the service and have been granted a disability rating and not for applications our transitioning active duty service members might be submitting while they're within their last 120 days. Now let's talk about the Schedule A Special Hiring Authority. This one is not veteran specific, so those of you who are listening who are not veterans, this will apply to you. You are eligible for a Schedule A if you are a person with a severe physical disability, psychiatric disability, or intellectual disability. Now I know many of us shy away from using terms like disabled or person with disabilities when we refer to ourselves, but will you or have you submitted a VA claim for a service-connected disability? Do you have some medical conditions diagnosed within your within your uh, uh, excuse me your medical documentation? When you look at what the U.S. Office of Personnel Management considers a person with severe psychiatric disability, a, a psychiatric excuse me a severe physical disability, psychiatric disability, or intellectual disability, and compare that to with what you've submitted to the VA or have in your rec medical records, they often match. Don't know if your conditions or con condition or conditions would qualify you for a Schedule A? Do a web search for the SF or Standard Form 256. This is the OPM's self-identification of disability form. If you see 
your condition, a condition that you have diagnosed in your medical records listed anywhere on that form, then you're probably eligible. To show Schedule A eligibility, you will need a Schedule A letter, which can be signed by your treating physician, physical therapist, or even a Veterans Affairs Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor. For those of you on active duty and your care goes through a military treatment facility, they also can sign Schedule A letters as well. Feel free to reach out to me or the medical leadership of David Grant Medical Center at Travis Air Force Base with questions, or if your local facility refuses to sign your Schedule A letter. I've already gone to war with twice over this and almost got an 06 relieved. So I am all about trying to do this and make sure this, this happens. Um, do you recommend to always submit Schedule A letter when the job announcement is only open to the public? Um, Mary Cruz, I recommend using the Schedule A letter as often as possible. If you cold call a recruiter, if you send your resume to anyone other than someone like myself to review, make sure it includes your Schedule A letter. Why? Because now I see that you may have the qualifications I'm looking for. Oh, look, Schedule A letter. Now I know I can hire you no matter what, so long as you meet the minimum qualifications. Um, Pat Griffin, yes, this does apply to overseas positions, but only federal positions and not contract positions. So building your federal resume, additional resources. I will be sharing all of this stuff uh, all this information later on um, in a uh, post event email. Resume writing, YouTube, that's on USA Jobs, communicating qualifications, how to write volunteer experience. The NIH or National Institutes of Health Competency Dictionary is similar to the Mosaic Guide, though it has a couple of additional inf uh, uh, references and competencies that the Mosaic does not. Um, again, the Federal Workforce Competency Initiative, General Competencies and Competency Models. Uh, link to that is there. That's where you'll get background information on the definitions for the competencies. Uh, code, uh, here's a link for your Joint Service Transcript, VMET. Also, information on veterans preference from USA Jobs. The Veteran Special Hiring Authorities through Feds Hire Vets is actually no longer valid. That link is, is a bad link. My apologies for not catching that sooner. Um, again, the federal resume, how we, what we've discussed today is only a way of doing things. It's not the way. The Department of Energy has its own resume guide, as does the FBI. I did not discuss anything about cover letters since I have never per, uh, personally used one. However, the IRS has a cover letter guide, as does the USDA, if you're interested in using them. I do want to highlight this. Um, this event um, for those uh, for military spouses that may be on the call. However, even though this event is specifically for military spouses, those who are not military spouses can live stream it, but they will not be able to register and take part. Um, again, the, interagen the Federal Interagency Vet uh, Military Spouse Career Expo happens on the 31st. It is 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. It is a virtual event um, at this time. The last I checked, I think there are 27 or 29 federal agencies signed up to take part. Um, last year, over 2,000 uh, folks took part from across the country as well as across the world. So um, for the military veterans, uh, veterans, transitioning service members, and our military spouses, please get the word out about this event. Um, for those of you looking for upcoming events, webinars like this, uh, job fairs, et cetera, this is the USA Jobs. They do have an events section. And finally, this concludes the resume development portion of our webinar. Uh, your feedback is important to make sure future webinars are even more effective. So please take a moment um, and go out after, uh, excuse me, and go to our after event survey. The link is shown here on top or by scanning the top QR code. Uh, below that, you will see my contact information. You can use the Popple QR code to add all of this information right to your device. Uh, please feel free to shoot me any additional comments on how you thought the presentation went. Um, but please make sure this uh, make sure this is in addition to the comments you make on the survey. So at this time, let me go through your uh, questions and then we will um, open the floor up. So I've got great. Thank you, Brock. So to schedule a letter is also more 
is more use than veterans preference. Um, Haiti, I would say that it is, um, they are both useful in their own aspects. If you are eligible for both, use both. Um, if you are only eligible for one, use one. Uh, thank you, Clive. I appreciate that. Make sure you put that in my post event uh, post event survey so I can show it to my boss. <laughs> With that, I will open it up for questions. Um, Clive, go ahead. Yeah, the QR code for the spouses uh, fair coming up. There you can go. You go back to that. Yeah, I just clicked in it and it shows it was a survey and it wasn't open. Did I put the wrong? Let me double check because that is not an event I am hosting. Sure. Huh, interesting. Let me try this other one. All right, go to the Q. Yeah, the QR clo code on the uh, use the QR code on the um, flyer. Oh, OK, we'll do so it. I don't Thank I you. don't know why that one. I don't know why the one on the left is wonky, but uh, it's wonky. So we'll just fix that right now. Let's go in here, go that and boom. There we go. Sol problem solved, problem staying solved. All right, back back to this guy. So, all right, back to questions. What do we have? Do we have any further questions? Now is your time. I am online. Um, again, this is the end of the presentation. So what I am going to do though is end the recording. And then that way you can feel free to um, ask your questions as you want.